today we will start the discussion on uh, magnetostatics and the word statics actually sounds a little awkward here because uh, when we talk about electrostatics we mean situations where the charges are not moving. So, the word statics there is very appropriate, but magnetism arises due to electrical currents and electrical current means charges are moving. So, the word statics that way is sounds uh, as if it is a contradiction in terms, but we define it in this sense. If there is a current flowing, we can consider two possibilities. One is that of a steady current that is I am standing here observing the current that is flowing and whether I that flow is independent of time whether I look at the flow now one minute later one hour later I see the same flow. So, if the flow does not depend on time then we call that a steady current and magnetostatics refers to problems where the current does not depend on time. If it depends on time then the formalism is much more complicated just like in the case of electrostatics uh, the, in the case of electricity if the charges move around then the situation whatever assumptions we made regarding the formalism in electrostatics they do not apply and we have to develop completely new ideas. Second question which we need to consider is we are talking about currents, current means movement of electric charge and just one minute ago I mentioned that the problem of a moving electric charge is a very complicated problem. So, how can I deal with this even steady state currents if the problem of moving electric charge is very complicated? Well, in that sense nature has been kind to us because we have the formalism of magneto magnetostatics was developed when people applied voltage to metallic wires and established steady current in those wires. So, we have a conducting wire through which well let us use the modern picture through which electrons are moving. So, I have moving charges, but I have these moving char charges which are moving, but in addition I also have positive ions sitting in my conductor and there is a nice balance between the number of electrons and number of these positive ions in any small volume that I consider. So, to give you numbers let us say I mean you all know that one mole of any element contains Avogadro number of atoms let us take that to be about 10 power 24. What is the volume of one mole of element? Well, that depends on various other issues, but as a rule of thumb let us take it to be 
one centimeter cube. It will be correct to within a factor of 10. And uh, now let me consider, so the volume I am looking at is 1 cc and let me consider and this contains 10 power 24 and 1 cc is how many meter cube 10 power minus 6. And now let me consider a small volume which is 1 micron cube. 1 micron is like let us say you have a hair, you can take it to be about a hundred, about a tenth of a millimeter, so a hundredth of a centimeter and we are talking about 1 micron which is a thousandth of a millimeter, so 100 times smaller than the diameter of a hair. So, it is a very small number and that is about 10 power minus 18 meter cube. So, if 10 power minus 6 contains 10 power 24 atoms, this will contain 10 power how many? 12 orders of magnitude smaller, it will contain 10 power 12 atoms. So, you can, you can argue that okay, maybe by the time this electron has come in, this electron has not actually gone out, very likely to happen, but we are talking about 10 power 12 atoms. So, within this large number, if there is a mismatch of some 10 or even 100, it does not matter. So, the picture we are taking is valid at any macroscopic level. We should not go down to the level of nanometers, but certainly at the level of micrometers, whatever considerations we are talking about are valid. So, at that level, any given volume is electrically neutral, but there is a charge flowing through it. And of course, I am saying it is a steady charge. So, in any given interval, the amount of charge that comes into that volume is equal to the amount of charge that goes out of the volume. So, that the picture I am talking about, I need to worry only about these moving charges without worrying about their electrical properties. Any volume I consider is electrically neutral, but it has a charge flowing through it. And among the disciplines of electricity and magnetism, which was discovered earlier. Magnetism, because people have probably, I do not know, thousands of years ago, people realized that there are materials which have some sort of magical properties if you wish and the magical property is if you allow the material to move freely, it will align itself along the northern direction and people have actually used this property to navigate when they are crossing the seas or when they are going to completely unknown regions. But a quantitative study of magnetism started after study of electricity and just to define things, 
we first had the so called Coulomb force between two charges which is written as some constant times q1, q2 r hat by r square. By the way, this notation Griffiths uses and I am going to use it from now onwards. I hope this is familiar to all of you. This variable r is r minus r prime and the here again we are making an assumption r prime is the location of the source and r is the location where the field or the potential is being measured. Or in this particular case there are two charges one is at r and the other is at r prime. Uh, instead of writing this as Coulomb force, I will write it as F12. This is force of charge 1 on charge 2. And so, strictly speaking, we should write it like that. And if I consider F21, then this is Q2, Q1, R21 by R21 square and this is equal to minus F12 because R12 hat and R21 hat they are unit vectors in the opposite directions. This is from 1 to 2 and this is from 2 to 1 which is very nice, it satisfies Newton's second law. Uh, mind you, Coulomb did all his discussion in terms of these forces. I believe it was Faraday who introduced the concept of electric field later on. The study of magnetism was pioneered by Ampere and Ampere also discuss things in terms of forces. So, Ampere did not write this, but let me introduce this. Let me assume that there is a line element dl carrying current i and there is another line element dl prime carrying current i prime. So, and the question is what is the force between the two? This is some constant times I dl comma I prime dl prime. Oops, I have to rub this out cross. R L L prime divided by R L L prime whole cube. I have put R or uh, okay, let me instead of by vector, I will put uh, yeah, let me write it in this form. So, First, let us compare this to Coulomb's law. There are some similarities. Coulomb's law had Q1 
here I have IDL. Sorry? Huh? No, it's square. And it had Q2. So I have IDL prime. So Coulomb's law had source 1, source 2 and product of the two sources. Here also I have source 1, source 2 and the product of the two sources. And Coulomb's law add R hat by R square and here also I have R hat by R square. So in that sense there are some similarities to Coulomb's law. So, I mean, this is the important point I want to emphasize in this class. Electricity, the, the mathematical description of electricity and mathematical description of magnetism, there are some similar features and there are some different features and we need to appreciate them both. So, now I am trying to emphasize the similarities. When you consider the force between two sources in electrostatics, you write it as source 1 times source 2 times r hat by r square. So, here also I have source 1, source 2 times r hat by r square. Difference of course is I have a cross product here and I have a cross product here. So there are two cross products and I hope that when I have three vectors, a expression like this is meaningless. I should either put this or because this is not same as this. Does everybody know this or yeah. if, every, if anybody has any doubt please take three arbitrary vectors A, B, C compute this product, compute this product and you will see that the two products are very different. So whenever I have what is called a triple cross product, I have to put parentheses. So and the parentheses occur like this, that is point number one and point number two. I can write d square f sorry l prime l by putting i prime d l prime i d l prime and then r hat l prime l dot 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 and you find that or rather this is not equal to minus of this. So on the face of it, it looks a bit funny that we are defining a force which does not obey Newton's second, uh, Newton's third law. However, I cheated a little bit. I introduced this intermediate step without writing the full answer. And when I write the full answer, you find that Newton's third law indeed is satisfied. And to see that, we should not consider the problem that we did. Previously, I considered just a line element DL and a line element DL prime. And these are 
sort of and i am saying there is a current flowing there is a steady current flowing but how can you have a steady current flow in a sort of disjointed line element somehow i have to push charges in here and somehow i have to take them out i didn't bother to address that question and i have defined the force without addressing that question and that's why i find that newton's third law is not satisfied therefore what i need to do is to define a loop c and another loop c prime and define the force between c and c prime and this is the same force some constant times integral over c i d l cross integral over c prime i prime d l prime cross r hat l l prime by r square l l prime so strictly speaking what i actually measure in the lab is i take a closed loop c and of course it's not the closed loop will have some battery so that there is a current running in it and i take another closed loop c prime which will have some other battery which will also drive the current through it and i measure the force of c on c prime and the force of c prime on c that is what i actually do in the lab so i define fc c prime like this and you can imagine i can also define fc prime c also and it requires quite a lot of if you do all that you will find that the force on c due to c prime is equal and opposite to the force on c prime due to the c by the way uh, i urge you to try it out but let me also warn you the analysis is somewhat non trivial first thing of course is you should know how to take the triple cross product and second thing you need to know is how to do contour integrals and some special properties which are related to contour integrals so if you put all that together then you will find that this force is equal and opposite to this force so newton second law is satisfied provided we consider complete loops any questions up till now i have put d square because there are two infinitesimals here usually that's the notation we use that uh, okay uh, mind you we do write da is dx i hat cross dy j hat so but on the other hand sometimes people do write instead of da people actually write d to r meaning that it's a area element so there are two infinitesimals involved for example griffiths uses the symbol d tau for volume element but lot of textbooks use the symbol d q bar for volume element indicating that there are three infinitesimals that are involved so 
it is I am using that notation. Yeah, sorry. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 but I, I have to be careful. See, I will push this DL vector inside this also because this, this R, it depends on both uh, L and L prime. So, integrations are not trivial. So, you can't say that integral DL over a closed loop is 0, no because integrand here depends on both L and L prime. But by the way, I sort of spent almost 15-20 minutes talking about this point because well, nobody explained this point to me when I was a student or even later when I became a professor. I realized this point only some 7 or 8 years ago. So, it is one of those uh, slightly offbeat points lot of textbooks do not discuss, but I wanted you to make you aware of things whenever there are these cross products that are involved. But you all agree that electrostatics was it is much easier to do if you introduce the concept of electric field and sort of decouple the force rather you associate a electric field to, asso to its corresponding source and then you ask ok what is the action of this field on a test charge. So, similarly here the Certainly, the analysis and even our insight into the problem is better if instead of considering two loops at one shot, we decouple things, we consider only one source at a time and ask what is the effect of that source and then we ask ok, this source it creates we say it creates a magnetic field and then we ask what is the effect of the magnetic field on another source. So, that is how we proceed and uh, so, the way we do it is through Biosabat law which we write as so, that constant which I left as brackets there is defined as mu naught by 4 pi i dl cross r by r square. So, again sort of compare this with Coulomb's law for electric field. And this is rho dq r hat by r square. So, the assumption here is dl is at the position r prime and the field is being measured at the position r. So, when I use this symbol that is unstated, the source is at r prime and the field measurement is at r. And the magnetic field of course, I do the
and in fact I can pull the i out of the integral because I am assuming current to be a steady current. Here I am assuming that the current is flowing in a loop, so I put this symbol, but quite often we consider cases where the current is entering far away to the left and is going out far away to the right and I do not particularly care where the charges are coming and where the charges are going, I am interested only in my neighborhood. So in such cases we will take it to be from minus infinity to plus infinity. So having gotten the magnetic field, then we say the force on a is equal to again you have to be a little careful I am using based on the symbols I am using I am using symbol IDL here and I am also using the symbol IDL here but after I do the integral there is no IDL anymore therefore this is a different ideal have to keep that in mind and so I have a current element at some appropriate point and if I know the magnetic field at that point I can find out the force on it. This equation is again similar to the Coulomb force is equal to rho to q which is the charge in the sorry rho d tau which is the charge in the element of volume I consider times the electric field in that at that point. Huh? Sorry? Yeah, 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 you are right. I should write it like that. So, the full Lorentz force then is integral ideal cross. I hope I have convinced you with the discussion so far that just as electric charge is the source of electric field, this quantity IDL is the source of magnetic field. The, this in all the equations I, in the in the equations I have written down, the equation for electric field contained dq or rho d tau and that has this ideal it has the same role. And similarly in the equation for the force I have rho d q times e and here the Lorentz force I have IDL times B. So the current and of course if there is current I can always define IDL. The current electrical current is the source of magnetic field. So whenever there is electrical current I expect magnetic field in the neighborhood and if I move away from the source the magnetic field becomes weaker 
and how much weaker it falls off as 1 over r square. So, if I move away from the source, the field falls off as 1 over r square. Now, what is the counter example to this? A case where you move away from the source and the magnetic field falls off as 1 over r. A infinite line, but this is the caveat whenever I have a source of infinite size, this rule that field should fall off at least as 1 over r square, it does not hold. So, when the, when the source is of finite size, you can take it for granted that when I move far away from the source, the field necessarily should fall off at least as 1 over r square. Of course, if it is a dipole, it will fall off as 1 over r cube. This is a sort of necessary relation between the source and field. And whenever my current source is finite, you will find that the field falls off at least as 1 over r square and in some cases it falls off as 1 over r cube. What is the situation where, where it falls off as 1 over r cube? Hmm? A circular loop. If I have a current going around a circular loop, if I go far enough, the field falls off as 1 over r cube. So, what does that say about the circular loop? It is a magnetic dipole. So, all these concepts that we learned in our study of electrostatics, we can directly apply in magnetostatics without explicitly doing calculations. But of course, all these formulas are there to help us do the calculations. In the case of electric field, uh, before I go on, I will let me define two other situations. Here, I am in writing this equation, I have assumed that there is a wire and wire need not be a straight line, it can be curved also, but there is a one dimensional object and this dl is the tangent to that at any given point, this dl is tangent should to that curve and along that one dimensional object current i is flowing. But I can have other possibilities. For example, instead of a one dimensional object, I can have a two dimensional object, I can have a plane. And there is a current which is flowing along the plane. So, how does this expression change? So, for 2D flow, B is mu naught by 4 pi integral K R prime cross R hat by R square d a. Uh, please note, I am replacing this I d L by K R prime It looks a bit odd, here I am putting the vector sign on dl, 
but here I am putting the vector sign on k. I am not putting a vector sign on dA. See, the direction here is the direction of the current and for a wire I take the current to be constant and the direction of the current I write in terms of dL which is the tangential unit vector to the curve at that point. But in the case of a plane, it is a little more general. So, in the plane I have to explicitly define the direction of the current. By the way, this k is current per unit length. So, I have a two dimensional area and there is a current flowing, but current is flowing across a length. So, I have to define current per unit length that is this k. I define that current per unit length at a position r prime and multiply it by the area element. In principle, the area element has a direction, but the direction of the area element is not relevant here. What is relevant here is the direction of the current. So, that is why I have put the k here and I make the substitution and the formula comes out. And in the case of volume currents, I have uh, by the way, since this is not a one dimensional flow anymore, I should not put that loop sign. That loop sign is purely for a current in a loop. This is this is a two dimensional flow and the integral is over let us say x and y coordinates therefore, there is no loop here. And uh, here for three dimensional flow this is j of r prime cross r hat by r square d tau prime. Oh by the way I should put d a prime here because this is the area element at the point r prime. So, I should put a prime here and similarly this is the volume element at the current j r at the current at the place where the current density that is current per unit area j is flowing. Again let us refer back to electrostatics. We have looked at the forces between two charges, then we defined the electric field and we found out how to write electric field for a point charge, for a linear charge density, area charge density, volume charge density and then what is the next thing we did. we define potential, but before we define potential we had to establish an important rule for the electric field and only then we could define the potential. What is that important rule? It, that electric field is a conservative field. How did we establish that? Come on I made your life miserable for three weeks by discussing those things. We considered divergence and curl of electric field. So, that is what we will do here. what is the divergence of the magnetic field and what is the curl of the magnetic field. And why do we do it? Again we appeal to Helmholtz theorem. If you know the divergence of a field and the curl of a field 
then in principle you can obtain what the field is. So, if I know the divergence of B and I know the curl of B, in principle I can obtain what the field is. Another thing of course, if you in the case of electric field, we looked at, we found the divergence and found that the divergence is related to the source and we found the curl is 0. So, you can say, I mean I was trying to draw various similarities between the electrostatics and magnetostatics. So, another similarity I will try to draw is hopefully one of these will be related to the one of these will be related to the source. So, that if I know the source then I can calculate what the field is. Of course, strictly speaking if I know the source I can calculate the field through this, but we also want to look at it from the divergence and the curl point of view. So, I will consider this formula and divergence of B is divergence of some this is some field some vector A and this is another vector B and you find that this is uh, here I am a little confused. So, if I take the divergence of B, B is written as a cross product of two vectors. So, I have to figure out what is the divergence of cross product of two vectors and if you work it out you will find that it is B dot del cross A or I should maybe I should have written it the other way del cross A dot B minus del cross B dot A. So, so let us substitute and I get del dot B is mu naught by 4 pi, well I will ok not by 4 pi times del cross j of r. By the way, there is an integral which I am not writing, but we have to keep that in mind and let us forget this mu naught by 4 pi also. Both of that I have to keep in mind dot r hat by r square minus del cross r hat by r square dot oh, sorry not b j of r prime. Now, what is this quantity? What is del cross j of r prime is 0. 
the argument of j is r prime whereas this del is acting on b which means that the differentials are being taken with respect to the unprimed coordinates therefore oh i should put a bracket here indicate that this del is acting only on this so ddx of j of x prime is zero so this term vanishes here no such luck r hat depends both on r and r prime so in principle the gradient operator has a non trivial effect on r hat and r square but what can you say about this you can say curl of an electric field or more generally it is the curl of a radial field so something which is diverging from a given point its curl is zero so this is also zero so we have this grand result that del dot b is zero no matter what current density you have and by use of gauss's theorem this means no matter which closed surface you take the magnetic field flux through that surface is always zero what does that mean that you cannot have see consider the corresponding electrical analog we had so if it is possible to have a electric charge then i can take a surface which can enclose it but i am claiming here that b dot da is zero for any imaginable surface it can be I mean one micron cube small one nanometer cube small doesn't matter for any imaginable surface b dot da is zero so you cannot have a source which will give you a diverging magnetic field another way of stating this is we say the electric field is the source of rather electric charge is the source of electric field so if i have an electric charge from that charge i have electric field coming out diverging from it but it is not possible to have such a situation for magnetic field which means that there is no object in the universe which carries a magnetic charge and strictly speaking all of you should scream because you have all seen bar magnets and if you put a bar magnet in a pile of iron railings you will see that iron railings stick to the left end and to the right end 
but not in the middle. So, obviously it looks like the bar magnet contains a magnetic charge at both its ends. Yes, it does, but it is if I do further experiments with bar magnets, you will see very soon that the bar magnet is actually a magnetic dipole with a north pole at one end and south pole at other end and you try to capture the north pole by cutting the bar magnet, what you will get is a shorter magnet, two shorter magnets like this, you will not get So, the only way we can get a magnetic field is through a dipole and that is why for example, if you take a current loop and you go far enough away from it, the field falls off as 1 over r cube because a current loop actually is a magnetic dipole. Uh, I will stop here now, but I will take two more minutes to clarify a point where I did not make a mistake, but I sort of made a misleading statement in yesterday's class uh, precisely related to this. I was talking about electrical dipoles and I said for a microscopic dipole, the field lines they go like this and then actually I made a wrong statement. The field lines close on themselves that is a wrong statement. The field lines almost close on themselves. There is this gap. The reason why I made the statement field lines close on themselves is because if I consider a loop like a Gaussian surface like this, then the charge enclosed is 0. So, any flux line that goes out has to enter back the surface. So, I was thinking along those lines and I said the field lines close on themselves, but they do not close on themselves because if the field lines close on themselves, then E dot dl is non-zero which means curly is non-zero that is not allowed in electrostatics and what happens here actually is I have the positive charge here and the negative charge here and I can come along this field line and I do some work but if I go from here to here the work done the field line here is in like this. So, going from plus q to minus q along the external field line, I am continuously adding non-zero positive work. So, coming from here to here I do some work, but then going from here to here I will do negative work and then whatever e dot dl I accum accumulated coming here is gets cancelled. Whereas, in the case of a current loop, I am sort of jumping ahead to the next class, but here also the field lines they go like this, but here they actually close on themselves and course, if I consider a Gaussian surface which encloses the loop, whatever field line goes out comes in, but in addition the integral b dot dl for this field line 
is non zero which means that curl b is non zero and that is what we will see in tomorrow's class we defined the magnetic field using biosavart's law we computed the divergence and found that it is always zero which means that you cannot have single magnetic charges and magnetic field at best can be only a dipole field but we will then compute del cross b and find its relation to the source of the magnetic field okay